Today is a special weekend. A um, friend of ours, um, Isaiah and Nettie, his wife, is here. Um, Isaiah is going to be um, preaching the word. I think I've met you maybe last year. Last year. So um, Isaiah has been here a couple times already. He's, he's a scholar. He's one of the smartest person I know, but one of the most practical, spirit-filled, spirit-led person that I know. And he's just a very passionate man. He's a great husband and a father of two. And just like me, he's a Lakers fan. And so, yeah. And his lovely wife is here with us. Um, we've had a great time knowing them. We had lunch. And they just love the Lord and they love serving. They're all about community life. Um, Pastor Isaiah is going to be sharing the word and some of the stuff that he's it's been going through in his life. So I was going to um, welcome him up on stage. Can we give him a warm welcome to Pastor Isaiah? I forgot to say, they're actually on vacation in Bali. And while on vacation, they're willing to fly to Jakarta. Um, um, Nettie just um, preached at the teens last night and today. They're willing to give up Bali to be here to preach the word of the Lord. So thank you, thank you so much. We love you. Thank you, thank you. Well, good evening, IES Encounter. How's everybody feeling? People in the back, you all right? Okay, you're still waking up? Hey, I believe that church should be a celebration. Um, it's something we can have a good time. It's a time to pause and remember what's really true, what's really important in our lives. So I hope the next 30 minutes or so, 20 minutes, we will have a good time together. Um, we're so glad to be here. This is my second time at Encounter. I was here last summer. For those of you um, who I met there, it's so good to see everybody. And uh, I brought my wife with me this time. This is my wife, Nettie. Nettie, you wave to everybody so they could see you. Yes, my better half for sure. Uh, we've been married seven years and uh, have two children that the Lord has multiplied our family with, and they're in Bali with the grandparents, and so we had a, a, a nice 24 hours of just peace and quiet. I don't think I've slept so peacefully um, in the last year as I did last night. So uh, we are really honored to be here, and, and I believe that the Lord has something specific that God has put on my heart um, to help all of us um, return to joy. Return to joy in the Lord. And I'm not talking about a cheap uh, sentimentality or just happiness or something that um, is fake or just a, a positivity that, that tries to make little of difficult things because life is hard, life is complex, life is challenging, and it brings up unforeseen and unexpected events. Can I get an amen? But even in the midst of that, it's amazing that there's a thread of grace that actually God can reveal to us even in the midst of the things that we experience that don't make any sense. Sense And so today I want to talk a little bit about joy. I want to talk a little bit about living in the power of joy, um, allowing joy to be what leads you and what guides you in the things that God has asked you to do. And so we're here in Jakarta. We're here in a huge world city. There's people everywhere. I woke up across the street in the Holiday Inn around, I think it was like 7, 6.30 a.m. in the morning, and I opened the windows, and there was just tons and tons of people just everywhere, moving, selling things, buying things, walking, running, sweating, um, everything you can imagine was going on right outside of our window. And, and one of the things, we, I've lived in cities my whole life. I mean, I'm going to be 30 years old, and the last 30 years, I've never really lived in a rural area. My wife, she's from the, the ranch, or as we say in Spanish, a rancho. And uh, they, she's used to just a lot of space, being able to see out far in a distance. And me, I'm used to the hustle and bustle. I'm used to the noises. I'm used to, you know, taxis and horns and music and and you know, all kinds of babies yelling and moving. And so one of the things that's so important, though, for those of us who live in cities, it's so important to find places to just breathe, right? To just be, to just take a pause from the hustle and the bustle and the busyness. Because what happens while life is good and it's fun to be active and engaged, and, and you can tell by the pace of my speaking that I love doing things. I love moving. I love creating. I love imagining. But God has called us to be human beings and not human doings. Can I get an amen? And what happens when we get caught up, especially in cities, and I found this to be true, that we overburden ourselves unnecessarily because of all the things that we think we need to be doing, 
all the pressures of other people and the rat race and trying to get ahead, especially if you're a young adult here, maybe you have small children, you know how much pressure it can be to try to keep up in a big city, try to make enough money for your family, try to make sure the kids have an education, try to make sure the kids um, can keep their lives okay, right? Like it's a huge responsibility. And so one of the things that's special about church and special about this community is it's a time just to re recenter. You saw the, the screens at the, at the beginning of, of our time together, a time to breathe and to remember we are human beings first. And so today, I'm just thankful for this opportunity. I want to give a shout out to Pastor Anthony and Abby for just hosting us, inviting us back uh, for a second time. And yeah, give it up for them. And God has called uh, this community to special things. And so what you see now is only the beginning of what God wants to continue to do in this city um, with you and your families and your jobs. If you're doing studies, if you're leading, if you're serving, if you're in a public service role, this is only the beginning of what God's up to. But it's only going to take place and it's only going to be something that we enjoy if we learn to just be. Okay, so today I've entitled this message, Growing Up in Christ. Growing Up in Christ. And we're reading from Romans chapter 8 um, and verse 12. So if you have your Bibles or your smartphones, uh, you can pull that up. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Growing Up in Christ. So I think I'm going to have it on the screens. We're going to read it together. So then, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. But it isn't an obligation to ourselves to live our lives on the basis of selfishness. For if you live on the basis of selfishness, you are going to die. Welcome to church. But if by the Spirit you put to death the actions of the body, then guess what? You will live. All who are led by God's Spirit are God's sons and daughters. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery to lead you back again into fear, but you received a spirit that shows you are adopted as God's children. With this spirit we cry, Abba, Father. The same spirit agrees with our spirit that we are God's children. But if we are children, we are also heirs. We are God's heirs and fellow heirs with Christ if we really suffer with him so that we can also be glorified with him. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, Abba, thank you for life. Thank you for the gift of today. Thank you that each person here has been led, has felt compelled, has been invited, or maybe even they were just persuaded by someone to come and join in in a time to remember that we are yours. God, that we are called to be human beings, um, to be able to enjoy the work of our hands, to be able to enjoy the gifts, the bodies, the, the intellect, the emotions, the relationships. God, all that this life entails of was meant to be a gift and a celebration of your goodness. So I pray today that you would restore us to that celebration. Recenter us to the joy and the music that's playing all the time that we often forget because of our busyness, because of our anxieties, because of our stresses, because of our responsibilities, and all the ways that we've forgotten to just allow our lives to, to play and to enjoy the celebration of your goodness, Lord. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for each and every person that's here. Thank you that you have sustained them to this point and that you want to use them in what they're going through to bless this world. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. So growing up in Christ, right, it's really funny because I've been married seven years, and one of the things that I am learning about myself that I didn't really um, think too much about before I got married was just how um, unflexible I am as a person, okay? Like, my wife has taught me, and my wife, she's, she's amazing. She's flexible, right? You never have any issues with me. Always completely, that's a joke. Um, but, but really, I'm talking about myself here, right, that it was when I got married, I realized just how much I have my preferences about how things should go and just how much um, I prefer um, strawberry milkshakes opposed to chocolate milkshakes. Just how much I prefer um, vacations to go a certain way um, and I, just how much I prefer to work, just how much I prefer to lead in ministry, just how much I prefer for things to be a kind of way that I, I enjoy, right, that I, I um, find to be most uh, helpful for me. It's so funny as human beings, if you're anything like me, it's true with all of us that we have our own um, preferences, right? Can I get an amen? Is there anybody in here? Especially if you're, if you're a type A personality, right, which I am. And uh, it's really easy when you have a, a personality like mine, there's a budget, 
There's a plan, there's an agenda, there's hopes, there's something you want to work out, right? If there, is there anybody in here who, who is a little bit similar to me, right? Okay, at least you're honest enough to admit it. Everybody else, you're ultra flexible. God bless you. But for those of us in here who have our expectations and our preferences, uh, there's nothing wrong with our preferences in and of themselves. But the problem is, is our attachment to our preferences. The ways in which we expect that we're only going to enjoy our lives if things go the way we hope and the way we plant. So paradoxically, to grow up in Christ is actually to become more childlike. And this is what we find all within Scripture, that to actually mature in our faith is to actually learn to um, be swept up in the wonder and the goodness of life and not be so adult, so mature that, that we think life has to look a certain way. Now, for me, um, I'm, a, I'm finishing up my Ph.D. I'll hopefully be done in May. And one of the things I write about and I research about is about social issues, right? I, I write about issues of racism, issues of poverty, issues of colonialism, oppression, capitalism, and all kinds of things. Now, you want to talk about having a preference or a way that I, want, I, I think the world should be, it could get pretty heavy. It could get pretty tiring when you're thinking about all the social issues that we face in the world. And if you're on social media, you don't have to scroll on Twitter very far to realize that there's a lot, of, a, a lot of evil, hurtful things going on, right? And so what happens is it's so easy to get caught up in trying to, to be about this change, to try to make this change. But what God's actually inviting us to, and I'm learning this firsthand in the midst of all of that, is to learn to have a childlike faith and a childlike ability to play in the goodness of God's creation. So about uh, nine months ago, I was in a severe motorcycle accident. Right, like Many of you might have heard about this. For those of you who saw me last year, maybe you're wondering why does he have his sock hanging out and his boot. And the reason for that is I was in California nine months ago coming home from school on one of my exams. And on the way back on the freeway, a Ford 250 came out of nowhere and hit the side of my motorcycle. I went about four or five cars, about 50 miles an hour, tumbled down the freeway, and a good chunk of my right leg completely came off. The, the bike landed on me. Um, I was uh, helpless in the middle of the freeway. One of the cars that was next to me had to stop and turn into the lane just to shield me from, from getting run over. And the ambulance came about 12 minutes later, and I was hospitalized for the next 30 days. And I wasn't just uh, hospitalized, but I was on medication. I couldn't eat. I had seven different surgeries um, take place in those 30 days. And up until that point, I had never experienced really pure being, at least a as an adult. I had never experienced just the, the, the profound realization that can come when we allow ourselves to be still. Now, it's really hard for me to be in that hospital bed when I'm, I'm used to writing, I'm used to speaking, I'm used to helping out nonprofits, I used to do ministry, all these kinds of things. And it was like for 30 days, God was helping me relearn how to find joy in my life, not just to do things for God, but to receive the joy that comes from being found in God right, to be still and to experience God's joy that isn't contingent upon our circumstances being ideal, because to get hit by a truck going 50 miles an hour, I will tell you, I wish that upon no person, and it's not a circumstance that is ideal, but somehow in the midst of that, I was able to come across this amazing joy, so there's a few pictures I'll show you just really quick of, of the accident, um, I had, there, there I was in the hospital bed, you could see my leg, it had a bunch of pins holding it together, um, that was, I think, day three, where I hadn't slept for a few days. Um, was in, they gave me all the morphine, all the drugs you could take, and it wasn't really helping. You go to the next one. Um, that was me, I think, day eight or nine, where um, I kind of came to this realization, you're kind of in awe, that what just happened to me? And I, and I thought, you know what? I don't understand this situation. All I know how to do is worship, right? And we sang about that earlier tonight in our service. And it was a profound moment of, of just um, connecting with God, not based on what I wanted things to look like, but just giving my life back to God as it was. Um, you can keep going. I think there's one more picture. And then that was me, I think like day 26 or something. That was like the first day that I was actually able to put weight on my foot again. Right, like I was in a bed, I was bedridden for 25, 26 days, and you could see the smile on my face. I was like exhausted, but on the inside, I was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm actually putting weight on my legs again. I, I showed just a few of those. There's me and my family. Those are my two kids, by the way. Um, there's Serenity. She's going to be four, and Valor, who just turned one years old. There's my wife, um, who was an amazing support and had to really learn how to be a single mother um, while I was in the hospital for 30 days. But I just share a few of those pictures to, to share with you what, what I'm talking about, this joy 
joy, this maturity in Christ isn't something where everything is going to work out the way you want it to. To overcome and to receive the victory in Christ doesn't necessarily mean that our problems or our difficulties are going to leave. But it's about learning how to live within the spirit of God, live within the mind of Christ, even in the middle of your greatest turmoil and your greatest challenge. So as we think about um, that scripture, if we could pull back up uh, the scripture again, verse, uh, verse 12 from Romans chapter 8. Um, we have an obligation, but it isn't to live on the basis of our selfishness. I wanted to teach on this idea, what is selfishness? Because in Christianity, we usually think about um, we're always supposed to give of ourselves. We always should do what's best for somebody else. But when it says that we're supposed to put to death the deeds of the body, in verse 12 and 13, it doesn't mean that your body is bad, that your mind is bad, that your emotions are bad, okay? What the scripture's teaching is that your emotions, your body, your mind, your own being is important, but it's not more important than somebody else. It's just as important as another person. And that's really what it means to live the life of the Spirit. So God doesn't want us to have some horrible life where our bodies are not taken care of, our minds aren't being tended to, our emotions aren't being dealt with. God cares about all those things. That's our bodies. But what happens is and where we miss the kingdom of God is that we place more priority on our mind, our body, our emotions than others. But in the kingdom of God, everybody's body, everybody's mind, everybody's emotion, everybody's experience matters um, as equal of importance to God, and God loves all of it. So I want you to write this down if you're taking notes, that maturity in Christ is the both and life. The both and life. Turn to someone next to you and say, maturity is the both and life. Think about this. Maturity is the both and life, which means that God wants the well-being not just of you, but also of your neighbor. Not just of your neighbor, but the, but the people you don't see and you interact with across the world. Not just the people you don't see and you don't interact with across the world, but even our enemies. That God cares about all the well-being of humanity equally. And that to live in the kingdom of God is to honor our own bodies, our own minds, our own emotions, but also to seek the well-beings of others. That it's not like we have to choose them or us. It's not like we have to choose who we want to succeed and who's excluded. The kingdom of God is a table where all are welcome, where everybody is invited to be whole, where everybody is invited to flourish, where everybody is invited to thrive. So maturity in Christ is not about um, this idea of emptying yourself. It's not about not honoring your own life, but it's about not honoring your own life at the expense of someone else. Does that make sense? It's about em embracing and owning your own body, your own family, your own story, your own ancestry, your own culture, your own language, your own practice, and also to value that of others as well. Maturity in Christ is the both and life. We also see that the Holy Spirit in this um, text, it says that the Holy Spirit reveals to us that we are God's children and that it bears witness to our spirit. What does that mean? It's amazing because the Holy Spirit is actually so much more present in our lives than you and I often realize. The Holy Spirit is so near to us in our lives that it happens in all the moments that we experience life as a pure gift. What do I mean? Most of the time, we only view our lives based on what we do and the result that comes from it. You know, if we eat healthy and we exercise, then we have a nice body, muscular, you know, we feel strong, we can run a nice marathon, something like this. We experience most of life as cause and effect. But isn't it true that not all of life is cause and effect? Because there's some moments in life that are come as a pure gift. For me, one of the most amazing moments was when my daughter was born, my first child. It was amazing to be in the room and when she was born and I was able to carry my daughter in my hands, I had never experienced emotion and tears and happiness like I did when I held my daughter. I mean, there was like nothing I could have done to ever have merited the gift of holding my own daughter in my arms. That was a moment of pure grace, of a pure gift. And the same is true when we see a sunset, when we see a beautiful view in nature, maybe when we fall in love, maybe when we, we experience a generosity from a stranger, Right? These are all moments that the Holy Spirit is bearing witness to us that we are children of grace. We are children of the God that gives without, um, that gives lavishly and abundantly, where it's not about our efforts to experience the gift. Can I get an amen? 
Maturity in God is about learning to, to realize that all of life is a gift. That all of our life is something we shouldn't take for granted. We shouldn't um, uh, think that, oh, you know, have low self-esteem or insecurity because you and I are the product of divine generosity. And there was nothing we could have done to ever earn the life we've been given. But before anything bad ever even happened, we were given life abundantly. I mean, look at the hair on your head. Look at your personality. Look at your gifts. Look at the way your body can move. Look at the way your senses work. Everything that God has given to us, God gave abundantly. And so the Holy Spirit teaches us that we are children of grace. You will experience joy the more you recenter yourself in the grace of God rather than just the life of cause and effect. Because I promise you, if you just live for cause and effect, you're going to be frustrated on the results. There's going to be things you do, and they're going to be righteous things you do. And guess what might happen? You might get persecuted. The people might, that, that you're trying to call justice to might actually um, in, invoke violence. You might actually be imprisoned. You might actually be slandered. You might actually be mocked. Therefore, the kingdom of God is not about cause and effect, but it's about living and operating from the pure generosity that comes from God and every day rooting ourselves in the awareness that all is a gift that comes from God. This is what Jesus bore witness to, by the way, because he wasn't a wealthy person. He wasn't somebody who had a lot of status and a lot of fame. The scripture talks about Jesus as a son of a poor laborer. And if Jesus knew that life was pure gift and pure grace as a son of a poor laborer who was oppressed, who was a member of a marginalized class, then it is true for all of life. And that's what Jesus bears witness to in all of us, that we can root ourselves in the abundance of God's grace. Lastly, this talks about sufferings, this scripture, and, and, and maybe someone on the keys or the worship team can come up as, as I want to begin to close this last part. But to live in joy is also to realize that our suffering, even though it's difficult and it's hard, um, our suffering, we can't let it keep us from experiencing the joy that God wants to give us in the midst of our lives. The scripture, verse 17, if you can pull it back up on the screens, it talks about um, how we are heirs with Christ. So watch this. But if we are God's children, we are also what? If we are God's children, we are also? If we are God's children, we are also? We are heirs. We are God's heirs and fellow heirs with Christ. If we really suffer with him so that we can also be glorified with him. So here it shows us that Jesus Christ teaches us that life is not going to, um, is going to spare us any suffering, okay? To be a child of God does not mean that you will not suffer. You got to get that, right? Because sometimes we preach this gospel like, like uh, you know, this joy, this celebration, this goodness. That doesn't mean that life is easy or that it always makes sense or that it always feels good to our senses. Sometimes it will make no sense. When I experienced in my accident and I experienced uh, seeing my, my wife have to be a single mother and seeing my children um, being so helpless to provide for them, that was intense suffering, right? And there's no way I can romanticize that or minimize it and say, well, you know, that was a great experience actually. No, I mean, it was a horrible, horrible experience. But I learned something profound going through that. I learned that whatever it means that God sustains us and God protects us, which we talk about a lot, right, as a church, it doesn't mean that God keeps the worst from happening. It does mean that God gives us a path in the middle of what happens to not be in bondage to the fear or to the identity now that we think we are our suffering. We are more than our suffering. We are heirs with Christ. And actually our suffering is also a suffering that Christ experienced himself on the cross. Christ experienced abandonment. Christ experienced betrayal. Christ experienced psychological torment. He was bleeding blood in the, in, the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? So what it means to be found in Christ doesn't mean that everything's easy, but it means that in the middle of it, there's a path where what is difficult doesn't have to define us. But the grace of God and the goodness of God and the Spirit of God can lead us and empower us even in the midst of our suffering. So the last thing I want to write, that I want you to write down is this. Alleviate suffering when possible. Otherwise, surrender to God. Alleviate suffering when possible. Otherwise, surrender to God. So what I'm not saying is that suffering is just something we should put up with. Like social uh, evils, social ills, um, biases, oppression, right? They're human created. 
Therefore, we should do what we can to, to show a better way to live, a life of harmony and a life of love, a life of relationship and connection. But sometimes things happen that are out of control, right? Sometimes we lose people we love. Sometimes bo- uh, illness besets our body. Sometimes our, our kids go through some tremendous difficulty that we have no control over. So do everything you can to alleviate suffering, right? To care for our bodies and the bodies of others. But if there's nothing you can do, the only way to joy is to surrender that control and say, God, I don't understand this. I don't even know what to do, but I place my life in your hands. I place my life in your care. Into your hands, Abba, I commit my spirit. This moment of Jesus saying Abba, there's only two places that, that, that Jesus, uh, that, that Abba is mentioned in the scripture. The first is when Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and, and says the words Abba. And then it's here in Romans 8 when it says that we know we're God's children when we refer to God or the divine life as our parent, as our father. Well, what, what is so amazing about that is that this transcendent, amazing reality, the, the infinite generosity and abundance of God is intimately present to you and I. That's what it means to call God Abba. It means that it's not foreign to us. It's not something that's reserved for when we're holy. It's not something that's reserved when everything works out. It's something that is intimately giving us our very breath in the middle of our pain, in the middle of our questions, in the middle of our doubt, in the middle of our fear, in the middle of my nerves not being healed, not being able to walk. I can still cry out and I can declare Abba. And that Abba is not an intellectual, rational Abba. That Abba is not just an emotional Abba, but it's the babbling of a child. I have two toddlers, and when they look at me and they know that they're going to get food, they know they're going to be cared for, they run into my arms, they dance with me, I play Aladdin, and I, and I dance with my daughter, and I sing into her eyes, and she knows everything is okay. This is what it means to grow up in Christ, is to be more like a child, to entrust ourselves to the care of God to not cling to our control and our preferred expectations, but to say, God, have your way in my life. I don't know when you're gonna redeem this. I don't know how you're gonna make good of this. I don't know when I'm gonna experience the peace that, that this person's preaching about, but I give myself here to wait upon you. You are the only one in which I place my trust, not in my money, not in my agenda, not in my mind, not in my degrees, not in my status, not in my looks, not in my circumstance, not when everything works out, but right here and now, Abba, Abba, Abba. Abba, you will experience a peace and a joy that meets you in the middle of that, that transcends all the questions and all the doubts that will allow you to see life again as a beautiful creation of God. I want to read a final quote from my phone um, that I want to leave us with and then pray for us by a Christian monk from the 1950s who talks about um, this reality. Listen to these words. What is serious to men or women, is often very trivial in the sight of God. What in God might appear to us as play is perhaps what God takes most seriously. At any rate, the Lord plays and gives away himself in the garden of creation. And if only we could let go of our obsession of what we think Uh, is the meaning of it all, we might be able to hear God's call and follow him in his mysterious cosmic dance. We do not have to go very far to catch echoes of that game and of that dancing. When we are alone on a starlit night, when by chance we see the migrating birds in autumn descending on a grove of junipers to rest and eat, when we see children in a moment when they're really children, when we know love in our hearts, or when, like the Japanese poet Basho, we hear an old frog land in a quiet pond with a solitary splash. At such times, the awakening, the turning inside out of all values, the newness, the emptiness, and the purity of vision that makes themselves evident provide us a glimpse of the cosmic dance. Uh, The more we persist in misunderstanding the phenomena of life, the more we analyze them out into strange, complex purposes of our own, the more we involve ourselves in sadness, absurdity, and despair. But it does not matter very much because no despair of ours can alter the reality of things or stain the joy of 
of the cosmic dance, which is always there. Indeed, we are in the midst of it, and it is in the midst of us, for it beats in our very blood, whether we want it to or not. This, there's, there's a music playing, and the music is saying, we are beloved. The world is beloved. God cares for the world. God cares so much that God didn't abandon us, but God incarnated the very struggles of the world to show us that there was value even in the midst of our struggles. There is value for you and your life and your family in the imperfections of it all. God's not waiting for a perfect picture to give you perfect love. But right now, in the midst of the messiness, in the craziness, in the confusion, in the despair, in the injustice, there's a cosmic song playing, and it is the love of God that exists and permeates all of reality. It's really the realest thing there is. And all of our faith is about awakening us to this. So I want to pray a special blessing over your lives that you would be able to hear the music again, that you would be able to surrender, to, to allow yourself to experience a joy that isn't conditional, not happiness where everything works out and God does everything you want, but a joy that comes from realizing that your life is not your own. It was given to you by God, and the only reasonable response is to give it back. The only reasonable response, the only path to joy and peace is to say, God, you gave me life. I give it back to you for your purpose to bless and love the world. Would you close your eyes with me? Abba. The one who spoke the earth into existence, who put the stars in the sky, who makes the planets spin in motion, the one that holds gravity together, the one that, that allows the seasons to change, allow the vegetation to grow, allow our hearts to beat and to pulse blood throughout our bodies, the maker of all, the creator of all, the sustainer of all, you are near to us. You see us, you know us, you, you delight in us. Who are we that you are mindful of us, that you would give of your infinite generosity our very lives, our very breaths, our very minds, our very bodies, that you would purpose us and fashion us and place us here to experience your goodness. Our purpose is to worship you. Our purpose is to join in on the celebration of life that you initiated. It doesn't come from us. It's not up to us. It's only our invitation to awaken, to hear the music, and to celebrate life, to celebrate you who loves us, who saves us, who calls us your children. I want to pray right now that you would begin to restore joy where there has been sadness, that you would begin to break forth a spirit of play and a spirit of lightheartedness and a spirit of, of, of just pure being, of not having to do anything, not having to make it look a certain way, not having to accomplish what we think we're meant to accomplish, but be able to enjoy the celebration of life that's happening as our very heartbeat that you give us. So right now, with all eyes closed and just hands lifted, if you feel led to just receive the gift of life, to be awakened to the goodness of God happening all around us, would you just stretch your hands towards heaven? And together, God, we just declare that you have given us our life. The only prerequisite to the joy you want to give us is that we would be humble and not prideful and not try to figure it out or analyze it or intellectualize it or cope with it or have our own strategies of dealing with it. But God, in the Garden of Gethsemane, what Jesus prayed was, God, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So God, I pray that you would give your children joy, give your children rest, Give your children lightheartedness. Give us an experience of how close you are, of how good your love is, and that we are all your beloved. Come on, right now, just, just, just say this to yourself under your breath or even in your heart. I am beloved. Come on, I am beloved. My life is a gift. 
we are beloved. Come on, just say that we are beloved. Every single human being without distinction, we are beloved. And, and this world, let's say this together, this, the world is beloved. The world is beloved. The cosmos, the universe, this earth is beloved by God. Nature, creation, it all screams of the glory and the goodness of God. The earth is beloved. Creation is beloved. This is all a gift of love, God, and we celebrate it. We are so grateful, God, that your love is near to us. With every breath, God, allow us to experience it more deeply, more richly, that we could relate to one another from your joy, from your peace, from our awareness that all life is yours. No circumstance, no suffering, no pain has the authority to steal our joy because our joy comes from you. The author, the finisher, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. Let us experience that freedom that comes from knowing that you have given us life and we give it back to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Can we show Pastor um, Isaiah our appreciation? Before we continue to worship, we'd like to pray for you as a, as a church, as a family. Um, would that be okay? Church, would you just stretch out your hands towards them? Join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for sparing Isaiah's life. And Lord, we know that you're going to sustain him and that you're going to supply all of his needs as the head of the family. And you're going to supersede his expectation. And you're going to bless this family. You're going to bless Nettie. We thank you, Lord, that she's such a good support. And, Lord, the desires and the plans and the vision that you have given both of them, we pray, Father God, that it would come to pass, Lord, and that everything that they would possibly need in life, and not just their life, but their kids and their grandkids in the future, Lord, that you will supply all of that. And so we pray, Father God, that they'd be able to enjoy, that they would leave this place filled with your joy and peace and that they would have a great time with their family and that they could just, again, Lord, enjoy this gift of life that you have given them. So we pray, Lord, that you would just protect them in their coming and their goings and that they would be a blessing to so many people, the nations and cities. Um, we just pray, Father God, for this couple, for Isaiah and for Nettie. We thank you for their life. We thank you the message that you have placed both of them and put in both of them. And we pray, Father God, that they would just have divine appointments, that you continue to open the right doors in their lives. And so we thank you for them, and we bless them in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So Isaiah and Nettie needs to um, catch a, a plane ride. And they're going to go back to Bali to their vacation. And so let's give them a thank you once again. And so before we end our service tonight, may I invite you to stand one more time. And let's declare it again, that we are loved by God. And we want to declare that in the midst of any suffering that we have, we love you, Jesus, and you are our strength. And you are our shield. I will love you, Lord, my strength. Worship me. Oh, I will love you, Lord, my shield. We love. 
Lord, you are our strength. And you will always be. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. It's never, it's never ending for us, Lord. So we thank you that you are here tonight and you do something amazing in our life. So we give you praise, brother. We're thankful. Let's give thanks to God tonight. Let's give thanks for all the goodness and, and faithfulness, and all the things that he has done in our lives. Let's give him thanks. So we thank you, Jesus. We pray for protection, for provision, and everything that we are going through. God is real and God is there for, for us. We thank you, Jesus, for this time that we can spend in your presence together in this place. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody say amen. amen. See you guys all next Sunday for a throwback worship night. We thank you so much for you, for you to be here. Happy Sunday and God bless you all.